a lot of people think when you sit in front of a uh, financial planner, it's like, hey, I have $50,000. What do I do with it? Got a phone call like that last week. I said, I don't know. They're like, what do you mean you don't know? I was like, well, I don't know anything about your life. Like, I need to understand what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do. And to be honest, I fell in love with just working with people. Oh, I got to go. I've been working, told them, please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid all my fees. I was starving for this day. Now my fan, they can't eat. Hey everyone, welcome to the Cup of Nurses podcast with your hosts, Peter and Matt here. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. We value your time. Thank you for the downloads. And if you find value in this podcast, please give us a like, comment, subscribe, hit the five stars. That's what motivates us and it keeps us producing this high quality content on this podcast. And as always, for any information, cupofnurses.com. Check out the website as far as the vlogs, the blog posts there, and all the cool things that we have going on for you guys. If you guys like the more consciousness route, check out We Are Frontline Warriors. We have a blog post every single week, and we'll have more things coming out there in the near future. Also, our shop. If you love this podcast, support us. Give give yourself a little gift, uh, whether it's Frontline Warriors shirt like we have the Be Well or Live In, Not In It, or the Cup of Nurses merch. Check that out, and thank you in advance. And of course, the Pronto app that we're working on soon, soon, soon. We're putting in a lot of hours every single week into this project, but it's going to innovate and revolutionize all healthcare. Can't freaking wait. How you doing, Pete? I'm doing great, Matt. Another amazing guest today, we have Aaron Fonseca. Aaron Fonseca does financial planning with North, Northwestern Mutual. We sit down and talk about financial planning, 401ks, and how to save as a healthcare traveling professional. Make sure you guys tune in. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking some time out every day to sit here and talk with us. Can you give a little bit of background about yourself and what you exactly do? Yeah, of course. So I am a financial planner for Northwestern Mutual. I've been doing it for the last two years. And to be honest, I just enjoy having a good conversation with good families out there. Um, I honestly enjoy just seeing where I could help each individual person. Every every time I talk to anyone, it's completely different. And uh, yeah, I enjoy just talking to people. So how did you decide to to pursue uh, like the an area in, in finance? Did something like trigger you in school? Did you just always have like an act for numbers or do you like math? How did you get started with all this? Yeah, so um, 14 days after I graduated high school, my I was supposed to go straight to college and what ended up happening, I ended up having a stroke. So my whole life fell apart. Um, I ended up having to work eight hours a week. My dad was in a coma for about three or four months. So I was working an average about like 60, 80 hours. I, I never got to see him that often. Like my mom would always FaceTime me while I was at work and it really like impact our family, like in a very, uh, different way. Like I just didn't know what to do. I was just trying to figure out and we were not financially not stable before that, but we had a good amount of savings. Like, but when that happens, like your whole world's turned upside down. My dad's the one that was making all the money. Like we were just like, Hey, yeah, we're perfectly fine. And that second that happened, we were just like, maybe we're not. And at first I, he's okay. Now I just want to get ahead of that too. He, after the coma, he woke up and he went to PT for about a year and a half. I was the one taking him to PT every single day. And that made me fall in love with uh, healthcare. I wanted to be a PT and uh, I realized if I did become one, by the time that they would get to me, the people that this had happened to them, a stroke or a heart attack, their family would already be damaged in a way. Like everything fell apart for a while. Like I wasn't talking to my brother, like he wasn't helping us as much. Like we were just all falling apart. And I just realized I really wanted to help people before all this happened. So making sure like everything's taken care of. He didn't have any long-term or short-term disability, like any of those obstacles that it's just like the first come, first thing we actually talk about, nothing was taken care of. And that's when I was like, wow, like, I started helping people and then I realized 
hey, like there's actually a career I can jump into this and be able to impact as many families as I could. And I just fell in love with it. Like every conversation I have is completely different. It's not more of like, you want to do something, you want to do the exact same thing. It's like every time I sit in front of someone, a lot of people think when you sit in front of a financial planner, it's like, hey, I have $50,000. What do I do with it? Got a phone call like that last week. I said, I don't know. They're like, what do you mean you don't know? I was like, well, I don't know anything about your life. Like, I need to understand what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do. And to be honest, I fell in love with just working with people in the healthcare. My girlfriend's an RN. She's been doing it for seven years. She was in the ER for four. Now she's in the PACU and her sister's actually in the NICU as well. They just love their career. And I just enjoy talking to people like that. And, uh, Travel nurses is where somewhere where I just love talking to. It's just you, I tell a lot of people all the time, you are on a treadmill and my goal is to take you off every three to six months, give you an update and put you back on because you're always running. You're always going from contract to contract to contract. And how can I help you? Uh, but yeah, that's just a little bit about me there. I uh, enjoy. I enjoy just having this kind of conversation and uh, it's usually virtually too. So wherever you're at, your comfort, your home, that's the best part of it too. I can concur definitely as a healthcare professional, it's really hard to manage your finances, especially in the travel nursing industry. You're always jumping around, your your weekly checks are coming in, uh, especially with what we're doing. There's money coming in and out from personal and uh, business standpoint. And it's hard to grasp where all this is happening and how to like put everything into like a visual planner in a, in a sense and be able to kind of see your numbers and what you can do. Mm. So what are some like some basic ways you can start off when it comes to financial planning? Yeah. So at the beginning is just having a good budget. Um, so let's just talk about like an average staff nurse, like you are making, let's say 50 to 60,000. It's good income. What I've seen happen is you go from staff to travel nurse and you're almost making three times your income. And I've already seen it where your uh, expenses jump up with it, where it's like, how can you actually take advantage of how much extra cash flow you have and be able to do something with it? Um, one of the things I actually have a conversation every time is you, in a year, you're pretty much making three times your income as a travel nurse. So if you did this for 10 years, it's the equivalent to working 30 years as a staff nurse. So how are you going to be able to invest it properly and manage it where you're not, your expenses don't fly up, but you can still live a better lifestyle? Because uh, the thing I have a conversation about is build a good savings account, not too much, but also make sure you're giving yourself like a two or three week vacation. Because if you're like my girlfriend, she loves her job. But there's times where, I mean, your your job is to help your patients, but sometimes like they're just so rude to her and she's like, I'm here to help you and you're not allowing me to. So just give yourself your own time for uh, to relax. I think first time, the first part is always just making sure you have a good foundation on your budget and how much you're spending and how much you want to save every every year. Um, and then also having a goal, what's going to happen, let's say if travel nursing slows down, how are you going to stay in the six figures a year? And I a lot of the things, a lot of the times that I talk to individuals is we are building a plan for in the next five years to have enough money saved up, saved and invested to actually go to NP school, to keep yourself in the six figures in case travel nursing slows down in the next 10 years. Um, but at the beginning, it's just making sure you have a good budget, you're investing properly. And then that is another thing I think we will jump into as well is, uh, your retirement accounts. Do you, uh, do you guys currently like, is that something each hospital provides for you? Some hospitals provide it, some don't, right? So since we're traveling, it's more of, uh, it's more of like our end kind of thing. So either the travel agency can, can help you do that or you or you find a retirement account somewhere else privately. But the, the hospital offloads that all on the, the travel agency. So travel agency is completely responsible for that. Or you as an individual are if you don't want to go with a travel agency's 401k plan. 
Yeah, and the only kickback with that is if, let's just say you're traveling for three months, six months, you get your contract, you open up your 401k with your agency, and you take a three-month break. Well, that company can't hold and invest your money anymore. So they just basically ask you, do you want to invest into another 401k, or do they, do you want you uh, to have a check sent out? So what I had to do is this year, I had to roll my uh, money over into an IRA. So I don't know if there's a benefit between IRA and a 401k. Yeah. And I can explain that for you. So do you mind if I share my screen? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. it. For everyone that's, you know, uh, doesn't have video or YouTube, for all you Spotify people out there on podcasts, our videos are on YouTube. So you can definitely come check this out so you can see the, the, whole, um, the whole video on the screen here. Right. So I want to describe the difference between the, a 401k and IRA and a Roth IRA and the biggest benefits of those. So let's use quick numbers. Let's say you make 100K a year and you have the option to contribute to a 401k, which is the same thing as a traditional IRA. And let's say you contribute $10,000 to it. That means this $10,000 you contribute to your 401k is not being taxed right now. It's being tax deferred, but you're going to pull it out taxed. So let's say you end up having about a million dollars in retirement. Let's say you have to pay taxes on $90,000 of your income. Technically, for quick numbers, let's say you're closer to 75K a year. That's actually what you took home after making 100K. After that 73,000, where I usually tell people, it's like, hey, if you haven't invested into a Roth IRA, that is your best option. So how Roth IRA works is the maximum you could contribute to this is 6,000 a year. So give me one second, let me show you this. So let's say you invested 6,000 after tax dollars into a Roth IRA, it grows tax referred and you end up pulling it out tax free. So if, let's say this ends up growing to a million dollars, you will actually be able, depending on the stock market, depending on everything, pull all this out tax free. So if you have, yeah. So it's just making sure that you're growing your assets tax-free. Um, conversation I always have is, do you think the taxes are going to go up or down in the future? Most of the time, what do you guys think? Do you think it's going to go up or down? Probably up. The way things are looking and being from Chicago, yep. things always go up. Yeah. Back in the 70s and 80s, taxes went all the way up to 90, 80 to 90% of your income. So you made a dollar, you were in the 90% tax bracket, they made 90 cents, you took a uh, 10 cents home. So it's how you're investing your money. And we think down the road, let's say in the next, you two are young, so in the next, let's say 15, 20 years, when you pull all your money out, you don't want it to be taxed. The thing is you always want to be able to contribute to a 401k if they allow it through work and they're matching it. So a conversation I have, let's say they're matching 6%. You want to at least put 6% because that's a dollar for dollar tax. I mean, dollar for dollar, uh, what's it called? Dollar for dollar tax. Yep. So if you made 100K and you put 6%, you made an extra $6,000 a year. After that, you should always contribute to a traditional roll it over here because you want it to be uh, connected to you rather than each individual time you uh, get a different contract, the maximum you can add, uh, contribute to a, a traditional or a Roth IRA is 6,000 a year, either of these. The thing that um, is very difficult is when you jump into different tax brackets. So you can't make more than a 140,000 and contribute to a Roth IRA. You can only contribute to a traditional IRA. That's what you call backdoor Roth, and that's when we get into all that. But you, sh the maximum you can put into these is six thousand dollars. So if I make, so if I make over one hundred forty thousand dollars, then I I can't put anything into the Roth IRA, right? Correct. You can only, yep, you can only contribute to a traditional, unless it's called a backdoor Roth. So that's when we would, I would help you. And we would go figure out, hey, you're going to to contribute to a traditional IRA and pay the taxes up front and move it over to a Roth. You're paying these taxes, but it's okay because I'd rather have you grow $1,000 to a million dollars 
tax-free rather than $1,000 to a $1 million taxable. Because depending on the tax bracket, depending on how much you want to pull out of your retirement accounts, you want it to make sure it's growing tax-free every year. So the main thing, main difference between the traditional IRA and the Roth IRA is when you're getting taxed, right? Yep. Okay, so for the Roth IRA, you're getting taxed right off the bat, and for the traditional, you get taxed after you withdraw. Yep. Okay. So I have money in a 401k from a previous staff employment, and I just let it hang out there while I have another IRA set up with uh, Chase. Is there a benefit of rolling over your 401k into a Roth IRA? Or is it better just to keep it at 401k since it's already like set up like that? Yeah, so that, uh, that's a tricky question. Um, so let's say you have a, let's say you have $100,000 in your 401k. I wouldn't advise you to roll it into a Roth IRA because you would pay paying all those taxes. So that's when, like, that's one of the conversations, like I've had a phone call before where they're like, hey, should I do this? I'm like, well, depends on how much you have, depends if you have enough money to pay for all those taxes. Because if when you roll your 401k into a Roth IRA, you don't want to do it straight in because you will pay all those taxes and all these penalties to make sure it turns into a Roth. Um, I do enjoy when everyone has everything together. Um, I have a conversation all the time. Uh, you, let's say you have interns over here, you have this over here, you have that over there. And you really don't know how, what you have because everywhere's in different spots. So you want to make sure like your whole plan is working together to meet your goals. So I always jump into, hey, let's say if you want to buy a home. They're like, well, how much do I need? If I have, I want to put $5,000 down, I have $5,000 in my bank account. Can I do it now? Well, you're liquidating all of your savings account. So yes, you can, but what if something happens as soon as you get into that home and you don't have extra money? So it just jumps into like making sure you're always taken care of. We're always looking at how much you should contribute to it. Um, and then did you, you said you have like a 401k through Chase? Yeah, I set it up like that. Okay. And it, is it, so is it a 401k? Is it a simple, like you, that's like the maximum you can contribute to those is at 19.5. So there's little things that we always like look into and it's just, what is your goal? Like, is it to retire when you're 50, 55? Like, uh, Man, let's retire when he's 30. So we got three more years to go here. Yeah, I got I'm doing a high risk. Here. It's kind of funny because at first when I set it up, I just rolled it over and like three, four months later, I kind of looked at my app and I'm like, oh, the money hasn't grown. It's really not much. It's only a couple hundred bucks because it was from a six month contract. Then I called Chase again. He's like, well, you got to invest the money into something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I don't even understand that part. So it's, it's wild how not financially savvy I am versus all the other things that I can do. So it's definitely a learning curve from the financial sector. So that I jump into that conversation all the time uh, with nurses. They're like, I'm, I feel like I'm asking these dumb questions. Like, to be honest, they're not dumb, like at all. Like, and I tell individuals all the time, if I went to your job, a hospital, and you're like, Aaron, do this, this, and this, and this is what you're gonna do this, I'm, to you is like nothing. It, it's in the back of your brain, like not, to be a nurse. For me, I would be like, you know what? Slow down. Tell me what you want me to do. And I'm still going to do it wrong because you've been doing this. You understand like this is your job. Like you can kill it at this. But it's like mine. It's like I do this. And like I understand it. My goal is always to make it so simple that I don't get into the weeds. Like, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is going to get you to your goal. Let's work everything together. I'm going to do everything in phases to help you. Because a lot of people are like, well, I want to uh, start a Roth IRA. I'm like, okay, awesome. Cool. How do I invest it? I'm like, well, the Roth IRA is just a vehicle. Then we have to pick the funds that it's going to be. And then we have to understand like there's steps into everything. Because if I just told you everything I do at once, you'd be like, hold up, what? <laughs> like that's way too much information at once. Like let's do everything in steps and like help you out. So did you uh, finally reach out to Chase and figure and get that taken care of? So to be honest, it's <laughs> still in the same process I left it as, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. Sometimes we're so busy with things, it's um uh, it's not my on my priority, but I think 2022 I'm gonna be making some changes. Mm. So let's just say right China off had that 150 turn into a retirement fund. Yeah, right, right off the uh, rip. Let's just say you're either staff or travel. What is a percentage of your paycheck that you should start thinking about putting away, whether it's for investing or saving? Yeah, of course. So what I 
usually do is called a 20-60-20 rule. So 20% of your income, you're usually going to use it for retirement accounts, making sure you have the right protection, insurance and everything. The other 60, it's usually going to be fixed expenses. So things that you have to pay for, pay things that rent, any of those. The last 20, I would say, please do something with your money. Um, a lot of people that when they talk to an advisor, they're like, I just don't want you to tell me what to do with my money. I'm like, I'm not. I'm just going to help you with the portion you want me to do because I want you to make sure you're doing something. Like if 60% goes to fixed expenses, paying all that. 20 is like, go do something. Go have a travel. Please have fun. A lot of individuals like, well, everyone tells me to wait till I'm 55, 60. I'm like, well, what if you don't make it? <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I, I sound like that, but it's like, I want to make sure you have a good life while you are putting money towards your future. I usually say 15 or 20 percent of your paycheck should go towards it. So let's say if you are a travel nurse, that might you might be contributing a bigger portion of your paycheck every single month towards your future. But let's say you go back to staffing, that's not something you should try to continue to contribute is that exact same amount because now you're going to be like okay, how do I figure this out? I'm making the less income now. What can I do here and there? Mm. So you should be more, yeah, you should be more fixed on a percentage than that actual amount, right? Yep. Just making sure you're always contributing 10 to 15 up to 20. 20s of you are being more aggressive want to make sure you get to retirement sooner rather than later. Okay. Yeah, it's good. I'm really glad you brought up the 20% to spend on yourself because we've had a few financial people and nobody really really mentioned that, that too much because like it, it's money you know, you can't take it with you when you die, you know, worst case scenario. So you have to spend some of it you enjoy. A lot of times, you know, people say that you should have X amount of percentage allocated for your bills just so you could you could live and then an X amount towards investing and savings and then whatever you have left, left over, throw that also into savings and invest. Nobody ever says, hey, you know, live a little bit, spend a little bit on yourself, make yourself feel good, you know, because that's you're, you're, it's your money, you're working for it. Why not also enjoy it? What are some tips or some advice you can give to somebody that's say finished nursing school and they're about to enter the nursing field and they're going to finally have some kind of a, a decent amount of amount of income? Should they start with a savings account? Should they right away try and maximize their their four hundred one k match with their employer? How should they, they go about this? Because they're probably going to be making more money than they have so far in their lifetime. It might get a little little hard and confusing on what they should do with it. Not to mention the loans they have to pay off. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that, so right at the, out of the bat, I always go, if they match, match 6% or whatever they do, make sure you're, you're contributing that percent. You want to start at the beginning. And I always tell this to individuals, you want to build good habits. If you build a habit, the higher income goes, your habit's going to go with it. And if you don't build that right at the gate, that's when everything slowly starts falling apart. So I would always say match whatever they're contributing to, and then um, build a savings account. You always want three to six months of your fixed expenses in an account for if anything happens. The reason I always say three at the minimal is your disability, long-term long disability kicks in after three months if you have it through work. So I want to make sure you have the exact same lifestyle. So, so let's say for quick numbers, let's say if you are bringing in 6,000 a month, and 3,000 of that would only get covered through your disability, but your, your fixed expenses monthly are 4,000. So what would you have to cut off if you weren't bringing in the whole 6,000? So I want to make sure you have a proper emergency fund to have the exact same lifestyle hurt and injured. Like I uh, actually, my girlfriend and I were just talking about this. I had a hernia and of course, I didn't listen to my doctor and he said, Hey, make sure you give yourself a good amount of recovery time. Well, this is right in the middle of my dad having a stroke and everything. I had just had surgery. So I didn't give myself enough recovery time. I needed to go because I didn't have long-term disability. Neither did my dad. And now I have another hernia. So this was like, I got it. I, I, I got that hernia like probably six months after my surgery and I've never got it fixed again. To be honest, it was very painful and I really hated it. So I just don't lift weights anymore. But you want to make sure right at the gate that you build a good budget 
So giving yourself, hey, I'm gonna, I'm going to put three hundred dollars towards my savings account every month. I'm going to put this towards this. And let's say an, if an individual is trying to buy a car out of the gate, what I always say is, let's say you're trying to buy a car that your payment's going to be three hundred dollars a month. Put extra. Let's say if you're contributing three hundred dollars towards your savings, put an extra three hundred, and see how your budget fills after you're paying that. But you're not technically buying that car yet. Do it for six months. And how did that feel? Hey, was it a little tight? Or hey, no, I had a, a good amount left. That's that's how you want to build your budget. Because if it felt fine, you can buy that car. But if it, it was too tight where you're just like, wow, I kind of want to buy a 250 a month car because I still have to buy it, pay it gas. I still have to pay for insurance. So making sure you're fitting that in your budget as you're going through life, not buy this car, buy that car, buy a house. And then you're bringing in, let's say, $3,200 and outflows is 3100 Yeah, that so You, you don't want to be stuck in that. You don't want to be that guy, mm. basically, only saving 100 bucks and not having a savings account and all that. Right, but having a nice car instead, you know? So starting off, let's just say, let's kind of take it back to the time that you had the whole incident with your father. How did you begin becoming and developing financial literacy? Uh, did you kind of educate yourself? Did you start kind of taking all the expenses in and putting in an Excel spreadsheet? What is the journey like for you to uh, become financially literate? So after my dad was back at work, I continued to work for the next three months, the exact same amount of hours I was working before. And I got my bank account to a number where I was like, that feels good. I can actually get other things done and work less to find how I'm going to be able to start learning. One of the first books, and I advise this to everyone I ever talk to, it's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's a really good read. It's just understanding like how the world works and how a lot of people, uh, it's just don't always make a thousand dollars, spend a thousand, like make sure you have the right cash flow. Um, at the, at the beginning, I started with actually uh, my mom taught me this. She, with the whole car and just putting that paint on the side, I did that for a whole year. And it was awesome because uh, I think my mom tricked me. But after doing that for a whole year, I actually used that $300 I was putting away and actually used it as a down payment for that car. So I continued to pay that $300. And I was like, wow, that was awesome. And I do that with everyone I always talk to. It's like, hey, if you are trying to put, Seven thousand dollars down as a down payment on your new home. Make sure you're saving towards ten, because that three thousand dollars is going to be to furnish that home. So always have that wiggle room. Um, but for the most part, like I was just, I didn't have that many expenses at all. Like I, uh, I did an Excel sheet with my mom, and I saw where her expenses were, and I acted like that was my expenses, and I saved my money if I was going to have to pay that again for the next three to six months. Because I, I was just out of high school. Like, I didn't have that many expenses. I didn't have a car payment. Like, I didn't have anything. So I just based it off what they were doing. So that way I could set myself up to for success. Mm. Yeah, I could also attest to that. The book that you mentioned, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's the first financial book that I read as well. And I was like back in 2016 before, or 2016, 2017, uh, back when Bitcoin was super popular. It was, was still growing. And I remember reading that book. And then, I don't know, after I read that book, I decided to start doing like some blockchain investing and, and, and Bitcoin investing. So definitely, um, Rich Dad Poor Dad probably taught me uh, definitely more than probably any other other book. It's, it's definitely a good uh, a good baseline because it gives you like a financial perspective, but actually like a real life living in it perspective. And I recommend that book to everybody as well. And that's actually a great question to ask is, how do you feel about crypto? Uh, do you advise anybody investing anything in it? I know it's probably a high risk, of course, with um, with a digital currency. Yeah, so um, Northwestern Mutual does not allow us personally to invest in crypto. So to be honest, guys, I can't really talk about it too much because uh, technically my name and I work with Northwestern Mutual, so they don't allow us to. So I can't really talk on that too much, but it's, it's honestly because it's so volatile that we just don't know what's going on. So that's where I just can't talk too much about. But hey, it's it's a good. Uh, yeah, I can't talk too much about. It. I'm sorry. No, no, it's it's okay. We can talk more when the cameras are off. You know what I'm saying? Um, so since you work for Northwestern Mutual, so let's say so somebody, a traveler, come comes up to you, 
uh, gives you on a phone call. What are, what are like the expectations? Uh, what are you guys? What are you guys going to talk about first? What are some common questions that that you ask your clients or some baseline information that that somebody should have before they reach out to you and start investing? Yeah. So actually, I'm going to give me one second. So the biggest thing that every single time I talk to an individual is just understanding what you're trying to accomplish. Um, as a financial advisor, I don't um, think everyone does the exact same thing. So let's say the first steps, hey, like, I just want to understand like where I'm at and where what the next step should be. So I'm going to share my screen. So this is where we understand the first conversation is identifying your goals, understanding what you're trying to accomplish. From there, we build the personalized financial plan to get you there the most efficient way. As you, we implement it, we're always going to review it because as time goes by, things are going to change. Let's say the first step in your uh, plan is to buy a home. Once you complete that, we're going to review it again. So now let's say you had a, a newborn. Now I want to start contributing to a 529 plan. So as time goes by, we always want to make sure your plan grows with it. Our first conversation, we always have two conversations. First one is identifying what you want to accomplish. You, your plan and his plan might be completely different. You're both travel nurses, but one is, let's say, trying to get into real estate. One is, hey, man, I'm just trying to grow a family. How can you help me here? What we always do is take care of risk management first. So making sure no matter what happens, you were hurt or injured or anything happens is taken care of. You live the exact same lifestyle you did before being hurt or injured. Next part is wealth accumulation. So how are you going to build your wealth? How are you going to make sure to get to the next step? Are you making sure it's building, uh, you're building it correctly? And the last part is wealth preservation distribution. So how are you going to pull from your assets? Do we have a plan? I, uh, I talk to individuals all the time. Let's say you get to 59 and a half and you have a million dollars in there. You're not just going to say, hey, Aaron, can I pull a million dollars out? We're going to have a plan to slowly keep built, uh, pulling out of there and give you an income for your life for the rest of your life. Whatever that is, that income you want to provide for yourself. But uh, it's usually if you start a lot earlier, power compounding is insane. Like you want to make sure you start earlier. That way you have a longer time to retire and that way you have a longer time to keep investing. Uh, I think the compound effect is a really good um, point here. Maybe a lot of people don't know what that means. If you could just explain a little yeah. bit. And I'm not, if I'm not wrong, they also talked about compound interest in Rich Dad Poor Dad too. I think that's where I first realized the, the benefit of compound interest. Yeah, of course. So actually, that's actually a really good one too. Give me one second. So let's say you have, let's say you invest $100. And your asset grew by 10%. So now you have $110. Let's say your asset grew now by 20%. Your asset will grow now from 110 rather than just the first initial 100. So every single time, it's just like, question I like to ask all the time is, would you rather have a million dollars today or a penny multiplied times, a penny times two every single day for a month? And if you do the math, actually, that penny is worth more than a million dollars today in, a month, in, three, in uh, 30 days. Yeah, it's a lot of pennies. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, because people fail to realize that that you have like this 10 percent. Let's just say, like you, back to the example of 100 dollars, 10 percent is 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 what you make. Then you get 10 percent of the 110, and then it keeps going up and it keeps going up. Can keep keeps going up? A lot of people will think that if you invest. Five thousand, you're going to get ten percent of that five thousand over time. But it's five thousand, ten percent of that five thousand. But then when that five thousand increases, is ten percent of that. It's not always yeah. that five thousand. It's, it's not your base figure. It's a continuous number. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah, and this is a great. Can you see my screen? Okay, this is a great uh, compounding chart. So let's say in this illustration, if investor A from ages 25 to 65 invested a total of 240,000 at a 6% rate return, they would have 1 million 43. And that is just like insane because it had so much time to compound over time. So let's say investor B, this is an average of 6,000 a year from 25 to 40, 
They invested a total of 90,000 and they got to 673,000 at 6% rate return. Investor C, they started later from 40 to 65. They actually invested more than investor B, but they have less than investor B. They invested more, but they had less time of compounding. And it's just how powerful that is. Like if let's say, and this is something too that I talk to travel nurses especially is if you can contribute more now to save for your future, and let's say at some point everything shuts down, you have to go to back to staffing, it's fine, but you don't have to contribute the exact same amount. But now you have a very large bucket of cash that's gonna start compounding for the rest of your life because you invested it when that was coming in. So let's say if you invested a total of 90,000 in one year, if, if, if you compounded for the next 40, 50 years, it would grow into a lot of money. It would just keep growing and as an asset. So you just want to make, to make sure, even if you're throwing $50, little by little, it adds up a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. It's just like, it's just, the longer you have it sit there, the more money it accumulates with you not really changing up how much you're investing. That's, 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 that's really, it's really awesome. And it's really passive. It's super passive because you just keep giving up to 20% or 15%, but that over the next 40 years, it's going to grow to a substantial amount. A lot of people don't realize that you could take 200,000 and change that into, you know, over a million dollars by the time you retire. And that, that's crazy. Yep. And it's, and it's awesome. Just like the little things that you can do. And it's just, just one of the things is uh, like you were saying, like you just have so much going on that you're just like, haven't got to it yet. Haven't got to it yet. And it's just, that is why like I enjoy my job because like I said earlier, like my goal is to be able to take you off the treadmill every three to six months and give you an update of what's going on. It's like you said, you have so much going on all the time. You're just like, I'll get to it tomorrow. Tomorrow turns into next year. And then you're just like, Whoa, like time flew by. I better call them. Hold on. Someone's calling me. And then you forget about it again. Before you know it, it's been five years, you're just like, all right, I think I'm finally going to do it. But that's now five years of like miscompounding. And like if it were, let's say your money would have just stayed in cash and would have been invested, you would have been like, whoa, like what happened? You should have done something for me. Yeah, I think a lot of people pull it off, put it off because it's something that did you do passively. It's not active. You don't actively see your money grow. It's something that you check back on once in a while. That's kind of why people kind of put it off or forget about it. But I'm kind of interested now with Northwestern Mutual, do you guys, because we're in our 20s, Matt and I, and we make decent money. A lot of our money goes into like our business and stuff like that. But for all the leftover stuff, what if somebody wants to do like more of like a, a high risk kind of thing? Do you do that with uh, with Northwestern Mutual or or do you guys have like higher, more high risk accounts like to work with? Or is it just like the more of like this, this basic compounding kind of stuff? No. So we do like brokers accounts. We do advisory accounts. We do all sorts of different things. It just depends on who we're having a conversation with. I Let's say if this doesn't fit you, that's when I don't bring that up because it's just a whole different conversation. That it's just like, hey, this isn't really fitting the individual I'm talking up to. There's, It's like if a doctor randomly got into way too much into the weeds and he's just, it's just going way over my head. I'm like, he's like, all right, probably shouldn't give you that much info because you don't really understand everything. But what's actually going to fit your certain uh, story or storyline or what you're what you're trying to accomplish? So we do like brokers accounts, we do advisory. So like a lot of the times, let's say for someone that's making six figures, if twenty percent, let's say someone's making hundred k, twenty percent of your income is twenty thousand dollars. So, I mean that's forty thousand, right? Yeah, forty thousand dollars. So what you want to be able to contribute more than just $6,000 every single year into a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. So how else are we going to do that? We're going to contribute into a broker's account, but each individual conversation is going to be completely different, but we can like uh, get into the weeds and everything. And just, is it mutual funds? Is it whatever that the best fit your specific goal? Mm. And our and our mutual funds like more of your higher risk accounts or or is that the, more of the brokerage accounts that are your higher risk ones? So a higher, it's a little bit of both. So every time I sit with an individual, we always take a risk tolerance test. So it's a loving question, is understanding: Are you more aggressive? Are you more balanced? Are you really conservative? And from there, that's when we, my team and I, we build. Hey, they this is going to fit their needs 
and their risk tolerance best. So let's say if we sat down and you came back very conservative, we would talk again and understand like what scares you? Is it just the volatility or do you want to be invested? And that's when we have to like figure out exactly what's going to fit your needs and how you feel about the stock market. So what, what if you flip it over and I'm like, I want to be very, very risky. Do you recommend like um, the brokerage account where you could do more more stocks and more see how the market performs? Would that be a good route or do you have something else? Like for somebody that's like says, hey, you know, for the next five years, I'm going to be making 100K Let's just say, you know, and I'm guaranteed 100K for the for next five years, and I want to be able to risk as much of it as possible to, you know, make me more, more money passively over time with, with, uh, with you. So, so the brokerage and advisor accounts, those are more just the vehicles, and what we put inside of them is like the investment. So, the like brokerage is more of like understanding, like, it, it each of these, it's its own vehicle. And just think about like your car. It's a vehicle and the people that are in it is gonna be your stocks so or your mutual funds. So if you are more risky, hey, you're, we're gonna put riskier assets of mutual funds or whatever your assets that we want to uh, add to your vehicle and build like, think about mutual funds and stocks and everything as people inside your vehicle. So it's just, we like that's like a conversation like I have with uh, each individual person is where are you more interested in? Is it more of hey I want to max out a uh, Roth IRA and I want to contribute an extra six thousand? Where else can we contribute this? And that's when we get into the weeds of where you should contribute to it, how it's going to grow, is it going to be tax deferred, tax free? So a big, a big determining factor is the amount of money you have to invest because if you have less than six thousand, why do the other one if you should first maximize? that one single account that's going to give you the most benefits. Yep. We always want to uh, contribute to a qualified account. So qualified just means it is qualified for, for tax benefits. So you want to contribute to those first because that's benefits that, hey, if you're deferring your taxes or it's going to, and it's going to grow tax deferred, but is it going to help you today? So let's say if you contribute to a 401k and you need to contribute an extra three or 4,000 to get keep you under different tax brackets like that's when you get into all those but you always want to maximize your 401k roth ira and after that we that's when we look at the next route and where you can and what we should do next okay uh for those of also coming out of nursing school uh do you recommend them putting their money somewhere else besides like a savings account because i know savings account doesn't always cover uh inflation and sometimes they lose you know their value goes down over a year is there something that they could kind of do themselves that's like a, like a savings account, but not a savings account? Yeah, they could do like a high yield account. Uh, I think it mostly always depends on like how long they plan on investing it for. Uh, and if it's more of, hey, like I need, the, I'm, I wanna build my savings account. I know it's getting destroyed by inflation, but I also need it in the next year for, to put a down payment on home. I would advise you to put in risky stocks because let's say by the time you are ready to purchase that home and everything fell apart, now you have to wait even longer to make sure that it goes back up. So understanding like your time horizon of each investment that you do and make, having a plan for each individual. Um, but it's just honestly, right out of the gate, I think always just trying. The average household, I'm pretty sure, is around 3,000 of fixed expenses every single month that they have. So my goal is always to have around $10,000 in your savings account before you jump into different things. That way you always have a set amount of cash. So you're just like, hey, if anything happens, a car breaks down, I could still get to work. I could still fix a car, like little things like that, that you never know. Like um, I would say, hey, make sure you have life insurance. Cause that's something too, that's very inexpensive when you're very young. And it gets very, it gets very expensive as you get older. Make sure you have disability that can provide it for you. A lot of travel nurses, we cannot provide uh, disability long-term disability because you're jumping from contract to contract. So we can't cover you there. Uh, but little things like that, I just want to make sure you always have a baseline and build it from there rather than, Hey, uh, what should, should I go buy a car right now? It's like, make sure you have enough cash if something does happen. Yeah, it's smart. It seems like we're playing a, the very risky game here mm -hmm. with uh, the way we're handling things, which is funny. Mm -hmm. I like to live life dangerously. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do outside of uh, financial planning? What do you enjoy in your free time? Man, I uh, picked up golf. Uh, I'm not the best, but I enjoy it. 
it's just a good time. I, I'm a very outgoing person. So like, I'm always like, Hey, can we go golf? Can we uh, pull? I'm not the best golfer, but hey, I enjoy being out there with friends. And I, I always try to be the life of the party. Like I enjoy when people are having fun and like actually enjoying their lives. Like that's who I want to surround myself with. I don't know. I think I might start going fishing too. One of my coworkers does it and they, you just, he said he just enjoys his free time out there. Like not thinking about the world. Like he just leaves his phone at home. Like, but, and to be, uh, I don't know if I mentioned while we were on here, but we just got a puppy. So, Hey, he's a handful as well. It's a toy Aussie. So at least six hours a day is given to him every single morning. Like I wake up at five in the morning, let him out, start feeding him and then, head out to the gym and then start my day every single day. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, it's like having a small little child. Right? <laughs> I, I was also curious, uh, It's it's been like over two years into the pandemic and everything. How has savings from the, the low income level people, like did it impact them or have people been able to save more? It probably sounds like a bad question because we associate pandemic with losing our jobs and not being able to save, but from your uh, expertise, have you seen something different? At the beginning, I feel like um, a lot of people save their stimulus checks. So that was really good. And a lot of individuals weren't spending it. So they build it. Um, overall, I think people have become a lot better at saving just because like you just said, a lot of people lost their jobs and you just never know the unknown. So we just try to be on the defensive side and just make sure things you're saving as much, and especially with inflation. Um, it's just little things like that. You just want to make sure you're saving as much as possible because what if you get fired? What if? And a lot of people are like, well, I don't think, uh, like I was having a conversation the other day. Uh, one of my clients were like, well, I'm not going to pay for car insurance anymore. I was like, well, you have to. And she's like, well, I don't ever plan on getting in a car accident. I'm like, Sure you don't. I mean, who does? Like, you no know, one ever wants to get in car insurance, but I mean, in a car accident. But you always want to make sure you're covered in case something does happen. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Awesome. Thank you so much for all those tips, Aaron. Really appreciate it. Of course. Where can people find you? Uh, they could find me on my uh, website. But I also, if, I mean, if you guys don't mind, I could also give them out my phone number. I don't mind when people reach out there either or my office phone. Sure. If you feel comfortable, you can give out your phone number. If you have an Instagram, your website, whatever you want to you wanna give to everybody. Yeah. I have my uh, phone number is 219-309-6574. And you can also reach me at my uh, website. It is Aaron Fonseca. So it's A-A-R-O-N-F-O-N. S E C A dot N M dot com. I, uh, I'm always looking forward to talking to new people and Hey, I enjoyed you guys. So thank you for having me on this. Awesome. No problem, Aaron. Hopefully to see you again soon. Yeah, definitely. Have a good one. Bye. Yep. Bye.